All right, well, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first presenter today, which is Cassandra Mahakian. Cassandra comes to us from Scripps College in California and is uh, mentored, was mentored this summer by Will Mayfield. And Cassie's uh, oral presentation title is Quantifying Uncertain Uncertainty, Impact of Sto Stochastic Physics Methods on Ensemble Forecast Quality. My name is Cassandra Mahakian. I worked with Will Mayfield as my mentor. Um, I'm an undergrad at Scripps College, and I also worked with Michelle Harold and Jeff Beck as part of um, an ensemble design group. Uh, today I'll be talking about quantifying uncertainty, the impact of stochastic physics methods on ensemble forecast quality. I'd like to start by giving a little bit of background. So weather forecasts are inherently uncertain for a variety of reasons, including physics approximations and limitations with resolution and computation and more. Ensembles attempt to characterize this with members that are produced through different applications of random perturbations. Basically, we're running the same forecast over and over with tiny changes at the beginning, so we get a variety of different outcomes of what could occur. Um, basically, we're trying to model error within the model itself, and so we're trying to get that error to match the spread of the ensemble. Our ultimate goal is to determine the best ensemble configuration for future implementation of the Unified Forecast System, or UFS, using the FV3 model. I'm looking at two different schemes today. The first is stochastically perturbed parameterizations, or SPP, and the other is stochastic perturbation of parameterizations tendencies, or SPPT. Both are different ways to perturb the physics within the ensemble. SPP perturbs specific parameters according to knowledge of atmospheric processes. It is more exact than SPPT, but it is incomplete because our knowledge of these atmospheric processes is incomplete. SPPT, on the other hand, applies blanket perturbations to all of the parameterization schemes. My method involves a model verification process uh, with two case studies, uh, with a quantitative side and a qualitative side. The quantitative analysis involves uh, statistical analysis using MET plus, um, and the two statistics that I'll be showing today are spread scale of two meter temperature and 10 meter wind as kind of a, a summary statistics of what we looked at. The qualitative analysis involves looking at paintball plots of composite reflectivity created using Python. This helps to provide context and nuance to these statistics. The spring case study occurred on May 17th, 2021, and involves a mesoscale convective system across Texas and Louisiana. I centered around these supercells in Texas. Um, these were a little bit harder to predict, and it's easier to see the differences between SPP and SPPT with these harder to predict events. In addition, um, these supercells are intense and extra damaging. So this event developed starting around 1911 Universal Standard Time um, with a supercell supportive environment developing. Uh, two and a half hours later, thunderstorms um, grew from that that then developed into supercells after an hour. Um, in this area, there was large hail and high wind speeds and eventually uh, tornadoes in Sterling County at 030 Universal Standard Time. As you can see with the SPC storm reports, there was a lot of damage from these supercells in the area, including um, those tornado reports and wind and hail. The winter case study happened on February 3rd, 2022, uh, began with moderate convection in a cold front moving southeast through Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. This cold front converged with hot winds from the southeast and resulted in high wind shear and this squall line, which you can see. Uh, beginning around 18 Universal Standard Time, tornadoes began to develop in Sumter County, Alabama, with a total of nine tornado reports, including one fatality and eight injured. Let's look at some statistics. Um, I will be showing spread skill plots as measures of model quality, and there's a couple of things to look out for with these plots. First, um, skill is defined by root mean squared error, which is the distance from the observations to the ensemble mean. 
Um, spread, on the other hand, is the distance from the individual members to the ensemble mean, or the standard deviation of the ensemble itself. Uh, the closer the spread scale ratio is to one, the better. Here are the statistics from the spring. So we're looking at 10 meter wind and two meter temperature. I also have plotted on here the combined model of SPP and SPPT to provide some context about whether SPP um, is a, provides a complementary information for the forecast to SPPT. We can see because SP, the combined scheme provides more, a higher spread scale ratio, that this suggests that SPP and SPPT provide complementary information for the forecast. In addition, we can see that SPP has a higher spread skill ratio, especially early on in the forecast than SPPT, and this suggests that it has, um, that it, it, while the root mean squared error is the same, the spread is increased. We see similar trends with the winter statistics. We can see that SPP does have that higher spread skill ratio than SPPT, and the stacking effect observed with the combined model is seen. Now for some qualitative context. So I created these paintball plots of composite reflectivity, which is the highest reflectivity at any atmospheric level. Reflectivity shows the strength and intensity of precipitation in the atmosphere. So as you can see here, the colored parts on the plot are the members, and I set a threshold at 40 decibels for this model output. This is able to keep the plots legible while still showing areas of high storm activity. The observations are the contour lines, and they are set at a threshold of 10 and 30 decibels, which is good to see the detail of the storm. Here is the evolution of the storm with the observations on top, the contour lines, and then the members underneath. There are a couple things that we can see from these plots. The first is that both models show pretty comparable coverage in this area. Uh, the storm event here was fairly well predicted and fairly consistent across schemes. However, if we go into central Texas, we can see that SPPT um, overestimated the storm activity in that area, while SPP did so, but to a lesser extent and with more spread within the ensemble. However, if we look here, which is where the storm event occurred, where there was the, the tornadoes and the supercells, um, this event was missed by both models. And while, SP, while both were missed it, SPP did do a slightly better job of predicting storm activity in this area. You can see some of the members were able to capture that information. Now looking at the winter case, we can see again the evolution of the, the squalling. There's a couple things we can pick out here. The first is that both models did in fact predict a squall line. However, um, as time went on, it predicted it like a little bit of ahead of where the squall line actually occurred and it continued to get further and further away. In addition, SPPT produced a little bit of a wider squall line than SPP. This would be a good place to do further verification using um, mode methods um, because this shows a bit of a, a phase difference with um, what the models predicted versus what actually occurred. There are a couple of conclusions that we can pull from this. Uh, the first is that SPP contributes high quality spread, especially early in the forecast, it consistently performed better than SPPT. Um, we have observed this as well with the paintball plots, a couple of those, those storm events were predicted just a little bit better. Um, in addition, we can see that the contributions from the schemes are complementary, and this is shown by the stacking improvements in the combined method. However, and this does suggest that while SPP does have high quality spread, it hasn't accounted for the full uncertainty of all of the physics parameters. 
uh, there are many next steps that we can take. Uh, the first is finding and testing ways to increase efficiency and reduce computational load. Uh, we're in the process to determine the efficacy of using older time-lagged ensembles as substitutes for some members. So instead of running all 10, we would be able to run only five members and then use older models that were run to fill in the rest of those members. This would reduce computational load by half and allow us to have more members to have like a bigger sample size for these statistics that we're running. Uh, we're also looking to develop a mask around the storm region so that the statistics can reflect the same area as the paintball plots. Uh, right now, those statistics are for the whole of the United States, and it would be nice to have that comparison for the specific storm area. And finally, of course, we'd like to engage with other verification techniques such as mode, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it's useful especially for convective storm cases. Um, thank you for your time. I would like to thank Jerry, who ran the Nessie program, and Will, who was my mentor for making this project possible and for the amazing experience that I had. And I will take questions now. And for those that are just joining online, if you'd like to uh, ask Cassandra a question, you can do so through Slido, which is through the web page, and you can post a question there, and I will read it out. Um, do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? Yeah. This was a really great presentation. Um, my question for you is, how did you choose the two case studies that you used within this research project for the summer? Yeah, so there were a couple of different factors that went into this. One was what case studies we had available that had already been run um, with the model. And the other was looking on the SPC storm reports to see where there were areas of, or days that there was a lot of storm activity or interesting cases. Any other questions? We'll give a second to slide or two just in case. Okay, no questions online. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Thank you.